Bibles, turn to Isaiah chapter number 11. Isaiah chapter 11. Continue praying for those. There's still some colds going around. A few folks uh, out with uh, illnesses be praying for one another and that they'd be well soon and back soon. Um, Isaiah chapter number 11, beginning in verse number, I just want to read two verses from this chapter to, be, to, to introduce a subject. <clears throat> and uh, this is not a, a subject that is foreign to us. It's about every, well, I don't know, four or five years I'll revisit it just as a reminder. But uh, Isaiah chapter number 11, uh, verse 1, There shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. Father, I pray that you would help us this evening as we think about uh, what spirit we bring to God's house. Lord, I pray that it would be so that we would please you and honor you with everything about us. Our, certainly our relationship with you, our walk with you, and our communication amongst ourselves as well, that it might all be pleasing to you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Here, and it sounds a little bit Christmassy, uh, the verse number one, amen, the root uh, come forth out of the rod of, uh, uh, out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Those are prophetic statements concerning the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, because he is of the, the line of David uh, from Jesse and on, and he is going to rule and reign. He is, he is the branch. It's, uh, it is capitalized, giving it the force of title. He is, uh, one of his names is called the branch. And, uh, and the Bible talks about that when he comes <clears throat> in that context of the millennial reign, <clears throat> the Bible says he will, uh, the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. And notice it talks about different spirit, uh, different spirits that he will have. These are not spirits in the terms of of uh, like uh, people think of a ghost or anything like that, but rather attitudes, if you will, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. The, the uh, Bible mentions many different spirits that we can have. It really has to do with our our uh, demeanor, it has to do with our perspective on things and the way we present ourselves. And uh, to, to introduce the, the message tonight, the Bible study tonight, I, I want to think about uh, the New Testament church in terms of it being a functioning living being or a body. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter number 12 and verse number 27, now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. Now, without getting too far into the doctrine of the church tonight, just suffice it to say that if you take uh, what the Bible teaches about the church, the church as it exists today is represented by individual complete bodies spread all over the place, but not parts of a body, but rather each functioning as a body. Local New Testament church is a called out assembly of saved, scripturally baptized believers who come together in order to serve God together. And God puts in different places the necessary components of the New Testament church to be able to function. 1 Corinthians chapter number 12 uh, is a chapter devoted to trying to explain the unity and, uh, and complexity that goes into a church explaining that there are many, just like in your body, uh, your body is not made up of, you know, 50 uh, thumbs. Your body is made up of a couple of thumbs and, you know, uh, eight fingers and a nose and two eyes and ears. And all these members being different 
one from another, complement each other, and go together to form a, a functioning, working body. And the Bible simply says it this way, if every member was an eye, then where would be the hearing? If every member was an ear, where would be the ability to smell and discern uh, fragrance? And so there's a reason why there are differences. They are to be celebrated. They are to be utilized, not to be, uh, not to be fought over and say, well, we all ought to be identical or exactly the same. Some people are, have abilities and talents in different areas, but all of them are meant by God to complement one another. If we're not careful as, as a church, as churches anywhere you go, uh, if, if churches are not careful, they let those dis differences become points of conflict when they ought to be complementary one to another and, and show strength because uh, then something's being done about all these different areas. But the Bible mentions many different spirits and again, this is completely separate from a study on, you know, uh, evil spirits or, or angels or anything like that, <clears throat> just having to do with our spirit. You know, somebody just has, the Bible says, a broken spirit and a contrite heart are pleasing to the Lord, amen? And so it's talking about, about the, the kind of attitude that we have about life, about God, about his word, about uh, God's house, to come to God's house with a good spirit, man. Amen. The Bible says that we are to enter into his courts with thanksgiving and praise. And several times over the last few months, the Lord has kind of led me to mention that because how different it is when we walk into God's house and people are praising the Lord. How different it is when we walk into God's house and people are happy to be there. When people have joy, when people have uh, peace, are at peace with one another, and it's a wonderful thing, and it's God's intention. But I want you to notice that uh, apart from evil spirits or the Holy Spirit, the spirits mentioned in the Bible that have more to do with our attitude that we portray. Uh, Isaiah 61 talks about uh, having the, the garment uh, of praise in exchange for the spirit of heaviness. Now let me go slowly here for a moment to kind of help you understand what these are. Spirit of heaviness is when someone is carrying a burden, when they are bogged down with cares of this life, when they're going through trials and problems in life, they might have a spirit of heaviness, meaning that they just feel, you know, pressed down. Uh, and so what Brother Matt was talking about, about feeling overwhelmed, that's a spirit of heaviness. Uh, in Romans chapter 11 and verse 8, the Bible talks about, according as it is written, God has given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see and ears that they should not hear. And he's talking about a, a segment, a, a time frame dealing with the Jews, where he gave them a spirit of slumber, meaning that they're, they're like they're asleep to the things of God. They, they don't understand them. They don't perceive them. They're, it's as though, you know, things are, it's like, you know, things going on around me when I'm sleeping. I mean, you know, house can fall down and, and uh, it's like, you know, oh, did you, what, did you see that? No, I slept through it, you know, just, just sleep through a, a hurricane almost uh, sometimes. And so uh, that's that spirit of slumber, in uh, 2 Corinthians 4.13, it says, we having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed. By the way, the Bible is explaining these spirits. Uh, when he said the spirit of slumber, he said eyes that they should not see. And so the spirit of faith, he says, I believe, therefore have I spoken. We also believe and therefore speak. So the spirit of faith means confidence in what God has said to speak boldly God's word. Uh, the Bible talks about it in Galatians 6 1. Brethren, if the man be overtaken of all, ye which are spirit, spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. And so, what is the spirit of meekness? It's an awareness that, you know, we're all cut out of the same cloth. And if somebody else falls into a time of temptation, 
we ought to approach them from the standpoint of, you know, that could be me. That could be me. And so the spirit of meekness. And then uh, in 2 Timothy 1, 7, the Bible talks about God has not given us the spirit of, pa- of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. What is the spirit of fear? It's the opposite of the spirit of power. It's the opposite of the spirit of love and of a sound mind. When you think of power or strength, like an inner strength, a sound mind, confidence in what God has said, and a spirit of love that where you can, you can uh, be benevolent to other people and not feel like it's costing you something. And uh, what is that? That's, that's the opposite of a spirit of fear. Fear drives us to be the opposite. To, to be regressive and not, and not assertive. It, uh, fear causes us to, to uh, have uh, uh, concern or worry instead of a sound mind or a, an assured mind. And so when, we, when somebody is, for instance, if somebody is not sure that they are saved, then they will live in a, a life of fear, wondering what's going to happen if they die. Well, when you get saved and you have the assurance of God's word that you are, if you, if you pass away, you will be with the Lord. It removes fear and it is a spirit of, of a sound mind and courage and power. And so in 1 Peter 4, the Bible says, if you be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you on their part. He is evil spoken of, but on your part, he is glorified. So what is the spirit of glory? Spirit of glory is where we are glorifying God. On their part, God is evil spoken of. You know, God is criticized all through our culture, made fun of, mocked. If somebody says that they're a Christian, uh, they're, they're demeaned, they are somehow, you know, cast aside and and, uh, and they somehow are not fit uh, to be listened to if they are a Christian because that you actually believe the Bible. Well, yes, we believe the Bible. It is God's word. And so you can't have a more certain and a more sure foundation. You know, you can pick up the newspaper and things can change every day. But you can pick up your Bible and have a certain word of God. And whatever it promised you yesterday it'll promise you today. And the Bible says, I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. And you know what? I can wake up tomorrow. My life might be upside down, but I can still do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. Why? Because the promise of God is sure. It does not change. It does not alter from day to day. It doesn't go up when a certain political party is in office and down when another is. It doesn't go with ebbs and flows of seasons and tides where, okay, well, in summer we're good, but in winter we're not. You know, it's it's not that kind of a thing. Uh, The spirit of of, uh, glory is where we are able to bring God glory. And how important is this? We're going to talk about this in a moment. When we enter the house of God, we ought to do so bringing glory to God, giving him the glory, praising him openly for what he has done and who he is. First John four and verse number six says, we are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of, not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. The spirit of truth uh, compared to the spirit of error. You know, we have to be discerning to know truth from error, that which is right from that which is not right or false. And we need to consider all of it in light of God's word. So there's a spirit of truth and a spirit of error. Now, let, let's thinking about this, and that's just, that's just a, a listing of some of the spirits or attitudes that we display uh, one toward another and toward the Lord to give us a foundation of what we're talking about. And, and uh, you know, when you walk into a home, that home, there's a spirit of that home. I don't mean, you know, the dust bunnies under the couch. 
that sometimes blow out and you think they're alive. And I'm not talking about that kind of weird, okay. I'm not, not talking about a poltergeist. I'm talking about just the spirit in a home. And you can tell if there's happiness in a home or there's fear and contention in a home. Why? Because that home is made up of people. It's not the house, it's the people in the house. And a home ought to have a spirit of love, a spirit of acceptance, a spirit of encouragement. That's, those are things that ought to be there. But it's, every household you enter will have its own spirit. And we've talked about, you know, over, over the time with the COVID and the different soul winning opportunities and stuff, sometimes, you know, enter into a place and it's like, there's just a different spirit in this place, you know? Um, it's just, it's, you know, sometimes oppressive, sometimes, uh, you know, uh, new agey, whatever it might be. Things have changed, et cetera. And it's got a different, you say it's got a, just, just a whole different spirit going on there. And then we're not talking about, again, uh, fallen angels or anything like that, just attitudes and the way we approach one another. But not only is a home made up of people and a nation made up of people, by the way, the same thing I'm saying tonight is true of a nation or of a community. Be, be, depends on what's going on in the world, the nation can take on a certain spirit. I mean, uh, remember back when, uh, you know, on, it's, it's seeming like ancient history now, but it's not that long ago when our nation was attacked on 9-11. Boy, there was a different spirit immediately following 9-11. I'm talking nationally. Nationally, there was a different spirit. People were coming together. People were, were uh, open about trusting God. And even our lawmakers were on the Capitol steps with prayer and, and uh, showing signs of, of unity. And what happened? It, there was a different spirit about that. It didn't take long for us to go back to our separate corners. But, but there was a different spirit. And in, such, uh, uh, that, in that kind of vein, a church is like a living thing. Because it's made up of people, it's not the padding we sit on. It's not the, the uh, 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 walls we are sheltered by. It's not the roof that protects us. It's none of those things. The church is people. From our youngest days in Sunday school class, we were taught the little song or statement, whatever it is, here's the church, there's the steeple, open the doors, and there's all the people, right? And so the, the, the church is made up of people. And when you and I, and the Bible says in the book of Ephesians, God gave some to the church, first apostles and prophets and teachers, etc., for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, for the work of the ministry, till we all come in the unity of the faith. God puts people in the church with spiritual gifts that are needed by other people in the church. But as such, the church has a spirit. Each church has a spirit. And I'm talking about a spirit other than the Holy Spirit, the Bible says, gives us a promise. Where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst. We're glad of that, amen. We appreciate the presence of God in our midst and it should control our words, our thoughts, and our actions, just the knowledge that God is present. But also the Holy Spirit is always present because he indwells those who are saved. And one of his responsibilities is to guide us into all truth. But we're going to come back to this in a minute, but let me mention now, remember that the Bible has a section that's called the fruit of the Spirit. These are things the Holy Spirit produces in us to give us the kind of spirit that we should have. And remember that we are to control our spirit. Well, that's just the way I am. I can't do anything about it. Yes, you can. We just don't want to. We, we have a bad attitude and we, uh, we like our bad attitude. You know, it's like it's, we start living slogans on sweatshirts and t-shirts. You know, it's like back up, 
remain a safe distance for me. I haven't had my coffee. You know, things like that. And we just like, it's like all, we're almost proud that we've got a bad attitude. So it's like we're bragging about it. My daughter, for Thanksgiving, my daughter had a, a shirt on one day. She said, sometimes I open my mouth and my mother comes out. And, uh, you know, you find out, you, <laughs> you, you know, you start saying the same things that they were saying. It's like, wait, where would that come from? <laughs> Where's my mom? Is she in the room? And, uh, and so that, and that's okay. My mom will be turning 88 here in a couple of weeks. And, you know, it's okay to uh, start channeling my mother uh, at this point. But when I was a teenager, I didn't think it was that cool. But anyway, uh, and so, but every church has a spirit. So let's think about this. Philippians chapter number one, if you have a Bible, and turn over to Philippians chapter number one. And having that background, let's just apply it a little bit in our lives because the whole purpose of coming to God's Word is to discover God and find out what it is that He would have us to do. Um, you can say amen there, that'd be all right. That, it's, that's, that's Okay, make sure you haven't left the room. I'm looking down, you might have got up and left. Uh, Philippians chapter 1. And verse number 27, follow along with me. You don't have to read out loud. Just follow along with me as I read. And the Bible says, only let your conversation, the word conversation has to, has to do with our manner of life, only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Every church, because it's made up of people, has a spirit. You can usually tell within just a few minutes of walking in what kind of spirit it has. Whether the singing is, is joyful or whether, whether it sounds like they believe what they're saying whether they're friendly or standoffish, whether they are, uh, you know, uh, inclusive or, or whether they, you know, uh, whether they're, they're stiff and liturgical. You can just sense the spirit within just a few minutes, usually, of walking in. I like it when you walk into a church service and before the service starts even, there's, there's uh, music being played and it's... Uh, it's uh, a good, lively, cheerful, happy gospel music being played. Um, and, and I think that's good. I think it sets the tone. I think it sets a mood or a spirit. I like it when you're greeted when you walk in the house of God by someone who's got something good to say about the Lord. Amen. Uh, something good about just even seeing you there. Amen. Uh, good to see you. Hey, been praying for you. Hey, uh, uh, how's, how's that coming along with the thing we've been uh, praying for you about and, and checking on things like that? I think it's always a benefit and a good thing. Why? Because it sets the Spirit, other than the Holy Spirit, uh, and he mentions here a spirit of unity. And specifically, he says, in the verse we just read, striving uh, with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. You know, even our conversations about God's word ought to be in unity, not in conflict. We spend, uh, my wife and I have been talking about this just recently. We, it just seems like sometimes we spend way too much time arguing about Bible things. Well, we ought to be praising God for the good things praising God for what he has shown us, praising God for the, the spirit of truth and focusing on the unity of the spirit. And so <clears throat> every church has a spirit other than the Holy Spirit. But not only, and let's follow this through here, church has a spirit because it's made up of people. It can have a good spirit, a spirit of unity, but... Notice this, that spirit can change. It can change very quickly. 
just let a little bit of <coughs> a, a let a little bit of contention creep in, uh, and uh, and pretty quick. It's like I was joking this morning about you know uh, when I moved here, and they said, oh, went to a hockey game and a, uh, excuse me, a fight and a hockey game broke out, and it's like you know that's that's the whole thing about you know hockey games. <laughs> it's kind of it's kind of made that way. Listen, you get guys skating around in an enclosed area, chasing a puck with sticks. You don't think a fight's going to break out? It's ready-made for a fight. I mean, it's just like a cage match built, uh, <laughs> built for, for, for entertainment, amen? And so, and, uh, but the, the truth is that if we're not careful, just a little bit of contention comes in, and all of a sudden, I was watching this afternoon, watching a little bit of a football game, and uh, it's it's like uh, it's like last year's matchup from from uh, I don't know, it wasn't the Super Bowl but anyway it, it was the um, uh, Philadelphia Eagles and the San Francisco 49ers and I'd love to see the 49ers lose because that would help the Packers and they need all the help they can get this year but that's another story don't get me on a bad spirit right don't start talking about how bad the Packers are, are doing uh and so uh boy you know there was a play on the sideline and this guy he just threw this guy down uh on the on the turf right at the sideline and when they jumped up here's this big guy and he's the head of security for one of the teams and he's just this massive guy their head of security, and the guy that threw the other guy down, it was, it was on the opposite team's sideline, so they're right there, and this guy jumps up, and the head of security puts his hand on this, guy, this football player and, and just like, hey, back up. Well, then that guy takes a finger and pokes him in the face, and it was on like Donkey Kong. I mean, it was, it was uh, you know, all hands on deck, it didn't quite clear both benches, but it was heading that way very quickly. And I mean, and the player got ejected. I mean, had to leave the stadium. The head of security had to leave the stadium. Threw them both completely out. And I was like, man, that's the most excitement I've seen in, in a long time. But I don't want to see that at church. <laughs> hey, man, you don't want to, you know, okay, we're having to eject uh, somebody from the left side of the auditorium because they can't get along with the right side of the auditorium. But the spirit of things can change very quickly. It was a friendly game till it wasn't. And the same thing is true of churches. Same thing is true of families. The spirit of them can change very quickly. You just let a little bit of contention. You just let a little bit of anger. Let a little, little bit of, of hurt feelings come in. And the spirit of it can change. See, why are you telling us? Because we need to maintain a right spirit. Remember, David prayed and he said, Lord, renew a right spirit within me. We need to recognize if our spirit is not what it ought to be, we need to ask God for a right spirit, for a good spirit. So the church is made up of people. Number two, as such, it has a spirit that, that is unique to itself. Then number three, that spirit can change. Number four, only you can control your spirit. Well, this is the way I am. I can't help it. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. If you don't, if you don't it's because you don't want to. We can change our spirit in a heartbeat. We do so all the time. For if you ever notice your kids will do something, and isn't that cute? But the kids from next door come over to your place, and they do it, and you're throwing them off the property. Who, who do you think you are? Well, what's the difference? You love your children. The neighbor's kids, not so much. And so we often will make excuses. So we do control our own spirit. Uh, what, did, what did your mom used to say? You got the same shoes to get glad in as you had to get mad in. In other words, just change your attitude. And that's what we're talking about, that, that we can control our spirit. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 11 says this. For what man knoweth the things of man, save the spirit of man which is in him, even so the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. Who knows the spirit of man? The spirit of man which is in him. You know if you're feeling 
uh, uh, compassionate or, or considerate or loving or, or favorable toward other people. And if you're not, it's not their fault, it's your fault. You say, well, no, you just don't know what they've done. Yeah, but I do know the Bible says to love them which persecute you. Oh, you thought it was going to be easy to control your spirit. <laughs> no, it's the hardest thing you're going to do. We tend to judge others by their actions. We tend to judge ourselves by our intentions. Well, I meant well. But when they do the same thing, you say, well, I don't care what they, they intended. This is what they said or this is what they did. But when we're judging ourselves, well, I didn't mean it that way. I didn't want to stir up problems. I, I just was, you know, just overcome in the moment or whatever. Well, just un, unovercome yourself and, uh, and make it right. And so the Bible says uh, in Proverbs chapter 25, great book of wisdom, amen. Uh, he that hath no rule over his own spirit, in Proverbs 25, verse 28, he that hath no rule, no control of his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. If you say, I can't control my spirit, then your life is, is, has already been ravaged. It's already been destroyed. No wonder we can't maintain relationships with God or with people if we have not learned to control our spirit. And it's more than, yes, controlling our tongue. You don't have to say everything pops into your head. There really should be a filter, you know, that keeps us from, you know, just, okay, well, I'm not going to say that one. There really ought to be a filter. But you don't have to say everything pops into your head. Some things are just not, number one, they're not true. Number two, sometimes they're just going to cause problems. And so if you don't have control of your own spirit, you're like a city that's, I, I used to think this way. When the Bible says there's like a city without walls and broken down, I used to think of a city that the walls are broken down and it's open for anybody to go in and take what's valuable out of it. But when you think about it, if a city has walls that are broken down, somebody's already broken in. Somebody's already looted it or taken what is valuable. By the time you realize that your wrong spirit is spoiling your relationships to where you can't maintain long-term friendships or long-term relationships in a home, by the time you figure it out, you've already lost so much. You've lost so much. And I'll say it this way. The devil has robbed you of so much that you will never, never get back. You can't unring the bell. You can apologize, but you can't unsay it. Someone might say, I forgive you, but it still registers. How much better if we can avoid saying it? You say, how can I do that? By controlling your spirit. You know what that other person in your relationship, your friendship, whatever it is, your church relationship, you know what they are? They are a gift from God to you. You say, oh, I don't see it. Well, you know what's not good? It's not good to be alone. Right? God looked at Adam and said, it's not good that man should be alone made a help, meet for him, made uh, Eve. And we are built for relationships. We are. And so uh, you say, well, yeah, but they're not perfect. Well, that's good, because if they were, they probably wouldn't have anything to do with me. Because I'm far from perfect. You see, what we need to realize is that other person, you know what the Bible says? When a man finds a wife, he finds a good thing. It's a good thing. It's a get, listen, Friendship, relationships are a gift from God. Every member of Twin Ports Baptist Church, no matter who they are, no matter what their background, no matter how consistent or inconsistent they are, every one of them is a gift from God. How do you treat gifts? Throw it in the corner? No. No. Man, if you, if you like it, you know, uh, I, I'm sorry, ladies, I just have men illustrations, right? And so, so if, if uh, somebody 
gives you a new gun. Man, you're going to take it around, right? You're going to show every, every guy you know, hey, look what so-and-so gave me. Get a new pistol. It's like I got a list of, oh, man, I got, I got to send so-and-so a picture of this one. Get a new handgun. Get a new rifle. Get a new something. Hey, you shoot, you shoot a, a, a deer, you got to send somebody a picture. Got to send somebody a picture. And, uh, and what are you doing? You're sharing your life with somebody else. And, and we realize, we need to realize that people in our life are a gift. Uh, and we need to treat them like the gift that they are. For what man know what the things of man, uh, save the spirit of man which is in him. Controlling your own spirit. The Bible says in James chapter number three, even so the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. One of the smallest parts of you is your tongue. But it has one of the largest impacts on relationships. My dad told a story one time. He said, he said yeah, a lady came in the, in the revival meeting, came to an altar during the invitation, and she said, Pastor, I've been a terrible gossip. He says, I've, she said, I've come to lay my tongue on the altar he said, sister, there's 80 feet of it. Use as much as you need. <laughs> so, <laughs> depends on how, how long your tongue is, right? And so, controlling. The tongue is a little member. But I'm talking about more than controlling the tongue. I'm talking about controlling our attitude one toward another. And that Bible, that verse says, behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. You know, almost every fire that destroys acres and, and buildings and causes deaths, they all started with a little flame, just a little flame. And that's the same way. We wonder why there's so much conflict in our life. Maybe it's because we are not controlling our spirit. Well, maybe it's they're not controlling their spirit. They said this and they said that. Yes, but what's your, how are you responding to that? You see, we can, we, are all, we can only control what we can control, and that's our side of things. The Bible says in, Ver, in Romans 6.13, it says this, Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. Don't yield. Yield means to give in, right? To let someone else, you know, you yield at the intersection, you're letting them go. You're giving them the right of way. He's saying, don't yield your members, even so your tongue is a little member, don't yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness. Criticism, gossip, backbiting, arguing, hatefulness, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, all of these things are are part of their sin that can be created by the tongue or offenses that can come from the tongue. And the Bible says, don't yield your members to do it. Don't do it. He says, he goes on to say, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. So the church is made up of people. As such, every church has a personality, a spirit. That spirit can change. Only you can control your spirit. If you say, well, my church is critical, you know, it's because you're critical. <laughs> you know, the, if you're part of the church, you're really telling on yourself. If, we're, if, if it's a church that is loving, it's because we're acting in a loving way, Right? And that's, right? Okay, you can participate. Say amen. Um, the once in a while when I say something right, you can say amen and agree with it. Uh, and so uh, it is, we are, we, we make up this church. Those that come and participate make up this church. And it has the spirit that collectively is us. And so what are some of the things that ought to be characteristic of our spirit. There ought to be a spirit of love. 
Amen? Love is, is compassion in action. It is caring about, uh, the Bible says, look not every man on his own things, but also on the things of others. Not just what's going on in your life, but what's going on in somebody else's life. You're having a hard time. How about somebody else? You know, is there something you can be a blessing to them about? Yeah, well, I want people to be a blessing to me. Well, give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give unto your bosom. That's what the Bible says. So we are to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. We want, we want God to take care of us. But he says, stop thinking about yourself, start thinking about others, and it'll be so. Spirit of love, spirit of joy. The, the root, joy is the root word of the word rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Amen? And so to enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. When we come into God's house, it ought to be like that old, I don't know if it's a Roy Rogers song, where never is heard a discouraging word and the skies are not cloudy all day. You say, well, did you look outside? It's dark outside. I'm not talking about outside. I'm talking about inside. Amen. And the church ought to be a place where we are encouraged, a place where we are helped, sometimes a place where we are corrected, but in a loving way. And so we control the spirit of the church. We should be a place where there's love, there's joy, there's anticipation of good. There's anticipation of good. That we anticipate that when we leave God's house, we're going to have had an encounter with the Holy Spirit who's trying to help us be more what we ought to be. There ought to be spirit of submission one to another where we surrender our, the Bible says that we ought not uh, um, live for ourselves we ought to live for to, to help be a blessing to other people that is something the bible teaches us to do and so a spirit of unity a spirit of holiness holiness well preacher wouldn't we just get along better if we just drop all the standards and all the thou shalt nots wouldn't we get along better hasn't worked out well for those who tried it why so because when people are allowed to just do what they want to do, that's what comes into conflict with other people. So you want to live your way, and you say, well, I've got freedom to do what I want to do. That comes into conflict with somebody sitting on the other side of the church, and pretty quick, there's an argument, a disagreement, a fight, etc. The truth is, when we can center ourselves around truth, and there is unity. That's when there's peace. It's not the dropping of standards that brings peace. The opposite happens. It is the upholding of standards and saying, hey, let's agree about these things. Let's, let's hold these things up. And the Bible, Jesus, excuse me, the scripture says this, that we are to worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Isn't that an interesting phrase? What you consider beauty, I don't know. But you know what God considers beauty? Holiness. Living a consecrated life, separated from the world. You mean not going in the bars? Yeah, not going in the bars. And by the way, and not bringing the bars home with you. Amen? It's like... Uh, the, the idea of a separation means that we live separated from worldliness, carnal things. The Bible says friendship with the world is enmity against God. So when we live a separated life, you know who you get along with? Other godly people. It's, it's a wonderful thing. You know, birds of a feather do what? Flock together. And so... 
You say, well, I don't know if I want to flock together with those people. No, you'd rather flock together with the people that are trying to kill each other, you know, people that are arguing all the time, people that are always talking behind others' back. No, you'd rather do that? No, how much better, how much more peaceful, how much more joy, how much more expectation and unity there is when people dwell together in unity and holiness. Philippians chapter 4. If you were with us in the last verse that we looked at, you're there in Philippians. Since we're close, I'll just have you turn there. Notice this, Philippians chapter 4, beginning in verse number 7. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Now, before we read the next verse, remember... Hearts and minds is a description of it's the way the Bible addresses our attitude. The Bible doesn't use the word attitude, but our hearts, how we feel about things, and our mind, how we think about things, merge to form this is our attitude about things. Whether it's people, it's how do you feel about them, what do you think about them, that forms your attitude. And if you look at somebody else and you say, well, you know, they're not much, they're not much. And they kind of irritate me. Well, what's your attitude about them? You'd rather they not be around. But if you look at that same person, you say, you know, I believe they're trying. And I believe that God loves them and I should love them too. Well, that's a different attitude. Same person. They haven't changed yet. But your attitude changed. And so uh, the Bible says, God will keep your hearts and minds. The peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, look at verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. You notice it doesn't say think on things that are contentious, think on things that are divisive, think on things that are, that are ugly or nasty or, or unholy or hateful or, or what they've done to you. No, think on things that are pure, think on things that are of good report, just, lovely, honest, etc. If there be any praise, think on these things. Verse 9. Those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. If you see a Christian and you know they're having a hard time, you know they don't have much, but they have peace. And you just scratch your head saying, why do they have so much peace? Why does it seem like they're happy? I don't, they have no reason Humanly speaking, to be happy. I'm going to tell you, the answer comes from their heart. Because they've got the right spirit. They love God. They've got enough. They might not have everything a heart could, you, you could want, but they've got enough. They're convinced that God loves them. And so think on these things. Now, I want you to notice something if you're looking there in verse number in Philippians 4. In verse number 7, it starts with the peace of God, right? You with me? Say amen. amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding. It ends in verse number 9, and the, and the God of peace shall be with you, right? So there's peace at the beginning, peace at the end. What's in the middle? Your thoughts. There's peace before and after the thoughts. You can surround your life with peace by controlling your thought life. A man that hath no control over his own spirits like a city without walls and broken down. Let me give you a thought. In Galatians chapter 5, verses 23 through 23, if you didn't know where it was, that's where the fruit of the Spirit is. Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. And it simply says this the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. 
Here's a thought for you. Make the fruit of the Spirit the Spirit of our church. Make the fruit of the Spirit the Spirit of our church. You say, what do you mean? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. You say, well, how can we make that the spirit of our church? Church is people. As such, the church has a spirit. That spirit can change. Only you can control your spirit. With God's help, you need God's help, but only you, no one else can control your spirit for you. So how do you change the spirit of a church? Change your spirit. Well, what if nobody else does it? Let God worry about that. But I have found this to be true, that a good spirit is infectious. You know, there's a lot of disease goes around we try to, you know, watch out for. You don't want to catch it. This is something you want to catch, right? When you find somebody that is joyful and you start hanging out with them, guess what happens? You become more joyful. You find somebody that is happy, it helps you. All of a sudden, you feel happier. In other words, we find the fruit of the Spirit is infectious. Make the spirit, fruit of the Spirit, the Spirit of our church, by making it our spirit. And so, now I'm going to give you the title of the sermon that maybe sometimes you ought to give at the beginning, but I chose to give it at the end. What spirit do you bring? What spirit do you bring? What spirit did you bring tonight? Spirit of anticipation of Godly things going on, anticipation of hearing from God, the anticipation of finding someone that will care about my particular needs, uh, the anticipation of love and peace and truth being told. Is that what we anticipated? I hope we found those things. And so what spirit do you bring? Not, well, I'm, I'm looking for somebody else to do No, what are you doing? What is your spirit? Because our church... Any church is made up of people. It has a spirit. It is the combined spirit of the people of the church. Father, I pray that you would help us tonight to do what we ought to do. To not use these things to evaluate others. But to use these things to discern our own spirit. Whether or not we are critical or or uh, hateful, or um, controversial, or proud, or uh, angry, whatever it might be, or are we, or do we have the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, etc. God, I pray that we would allow you to work in our lives and make the fruit of the Spirit our spirit, the spirit of unity and joy, rejoicing, glorifying God. Lord, I pray that it would be so that you'd be pleased with this. And because of that, souls might be saved and lives might be changed. I ask it in Jesus' precious name with our heads bowed and our eyes closed.